For over 30 years, the Queensland Mining Industry Health and Safety Conference has brought the industry together to promote and share safety and health initiatives to make our mines a safe place to work. This video is part of a series to share within our industry, learning from the lessons of the past for future generations. We'll look into the history of mining, safety and health, the Queensland Mining Safety and Health legislation, mining safety and health management, surface mining hazards and underground mining hazards. You should have already watched the history of mining safety and health. There is a long history of death and disaster, injury and illness resulting from the mining industry. And despite our improvements over time, over 50 lives have been lost in Queensland mines in the last 20 years. Every person deserves a safe place to work. We all have to believe that every mine can be operated safely. And if we learn from our past, it will help protect us into the future. Mining safety and health legislation has developed over a long time, normally following a major inquiry into a mine disaster. In 1842 in the UK, the first mining legislation was developed after the Husker Pit disaster in 1838, which drowned 26 children. It was updated in 1850 following the Haswell mine explosion. In Queensland, separate coal and metals mining legislation was recommended in 1900 in the Torben Lee Royal Commission, but it wasn't implemented until after Queensland's worst mine disaster, the Mount Mulligan explosion in 1921, where 75 miners were killed. It remained in place until 1999 when the legislation was changed following four major mine disasters, three at the Maurer Mine in central Queensland. The previous legislation was based on the old way. The old way was prescribed positions, referred to normally as statutory positions, and prescribed requirements. It clearly didn't work effectively. New South Wales also suffered similar disasters, including the South Bolli outburst in 1991, the Gretley inrush in 1996, and the North Parks air blast in 1999. It also reformed its leg legislation towards the new model around the same time as Queensland. The UK adopted a new way of workplace legislation in 1974, following the Aberfan disaster in Wales in 1966. Queensland adopted this new way in the reformed mining legislation in 1999. Queensland still maintains separate coal and mining inquiring legislation. And this is also separate to work health and safety legislation. The Work Health and Safety Act does not apply at a Queensland mine. The legislation provides a framework for the industry to operate in. Rather than prescribing specific positions and requirements, Today, the legislation places obligations on persons who operate mines to manage them in order to protect the safety of the persons at the mine or persons who may be affected by their operations. The Acts provide a hierarchy of requirements for mine operators to follow, including regulations, industry standards called recognised standards in coal mines, guidelines in mines and quarries, and codes of practice under work health and safety. Other advisory information is provided through guidance notes, safety notices, databases and other information. The government, through the Minister for Resources, is advised through an industry consultative committee chaired by the Commissioner for Resources, Safety and Health, represented by inspectors, mine operators and workers' representatives. The Act provides for the government to employ persons in roles as inspectors or other officers to implement the requirements of the respective Acts. Today, that organisation is Resources Safety and Health Queensland, a strong partner of the Queensland Mining Industry Health and Safety Conference. Any person who may affect the safety of a person at a mine has a safety and health obligation under the legislation. The fundamental principle of the legislation is to require mine operators to manage the risks at their mines to an acceptable level in order to protect the safety of persons not just at their mine, but anyone who may be affected by their operations. Every mine is required to have a single person responsible for the mine, the site senior executive, and they are obligated to develop a management structure with competent persons in senior and supervisory positions who must develop and implement a safety and health management system for their mine. Every person at a mine has an obligation. 
in your work group, review your obligations and how you can discharge them in a practical way to ensure your own safety and the safety and health of others. Workers have had a statutory right for representation on safety and health matters for as long as mining legislation has existed. Today it exists through the election of safety and health representatives at both a site level or an industry level or a district level. Mining inquiring legislation provides further consultation through committees, but the fundamental requirement for each mine is to consult with workers who are affected by the hazards at the mine to determine how they can best be controlled. Mining inquiring legislation have developed a guidance note for safety and health representatives. In your work group, identify your safety and health representative and discuss how and when you should contact them and their functions and powers. In the old legislation, the government would prescribe the positions and their required competencies and mine disasters still occurred. The current legislation requires the SSE to develop and maintain a management structure to state the competencies and the responsibilities required at their mine to manage their operation to an acceptable level of risk. There is a recognised standard which states how to achieve this. In support of the management structure, there are industry training packages and they've evolved over the past 25 years. Since 2009, it has been known as the Resources and Infrastructure Industries Training Package. A few statutory certificates still exist from the old legislation, but the vast majority of positions, competencies and responsibilities are required to be established by the SSE for their mind. Each person in the management structure that's in a senior or supervisory position should review their responsibilities for either the development or implementation of the safety and health management system at your mine. No two mines are the same. Now the legislation requires each mine to develop and implement a safety and health management system for that mine. The management system requirements are based on risk management and continuous improvement. There are standards available to assist mine operators with the development of these management systems. Controls must be established to ensure that the risk to persons from mining hazards and other hazards are at an acceptable level. Controls must be monitored, such as a gas monitoring system, and when the risk increases, additional actions and controls are required to be implemented to reduce the risk back to an acceptable level. At some point, when the risk is no longer acceptable, persons must be withdrawn to a place of safety. This process is called a trigger action response plan. Sadly, these had to be recommended in the inquiry into the Mara 2 disaster in 1994. Mining operations create hazards that have the potential to cause serious or disastrous events, resulting in death, injury or illness to workers or other persons. Hazard management plans are required for controlling and managing hazards at the mine and those plans will include standard operating procedures or standard work instructions that provide for the controlling hazards during tasks carried out by mine workers. Following videos will discuss these hazards in more detail but include hazards such as at a surface mine, vehicle interaction, ground control, explosives, water or tailings dams, electricity, plant and equipment, and respirable dust. Underground mining hazards include coal dust, explosive or noxious gases, mine fires, strata failure, transport, bodies of water, plant and equipment, and respirable dust. In your work group, review the principal hazards at your mine and the critical controls required to ensure that they are managed to an acceptable level of risk. The regulation prescribes ways of achieving an acceptable level of risk. It's regrettable that many of the regulatory requirements of today have resulted from past mine accidents. For example, vehicle interaction requirements have resulted from accidents between heavy and light vehicles. 
Modification of plant and isolation requirements have resulted from accidents where workers have been trapped in mining equipment. The legislation requires competent supervision of mining operations. The supervisor is critical for the implementation of the controls required by the mine's safety and health management system. Inadequate supervision has been identified as being a major contributing factor into serious accidents. It's an area where improvement is needed. The mining inquiring legislation have developed a guidance note to improve mine supervision. Mine workers' health has received a high focus since the recent cases of lung disease in Queensland mine workers. Health assessments and health monitoring have always been important as part of every worker's employment for health-related mining risks. Despite our best efforts, there is always a risk of an emergency situation. Every mine is required to establish an emergency management capability which provides for preparedness and response to emergency events. Training and simulated emergency scenarios are required to practice the emergency procedures and equipment. We hope we never need them, but we need to be confident that they work when we do. Preparing for an emergency is almost as important as preventing them. A key element of the legislation and safety and health management is safety and health performance monitoring. The goal of safety and health monitoring is to identify areas where improvement is required and focus on those areas for improved safety and health risk management. Every person is accountable for their actions. The legislation places safety and health obligations on every person to ensure their own safety and the safety and health of others. RSHQ has a compliance policy which provides actions available to be taken to ensure the requirements of the legislation are complied with. In the most severe circumstances, legal proceedings and court action may impose penalties on those who are guilty to failing to discharge their obligations. Despite the deterrent that a prosecution may offer, it's irrelevant in comparison to the pain and suffering of our mine workers and their families. In summary, the legislation provides a framework for the safe operation of every mine. It essentially exists in two parts, what the government requires and what mining operations are required to do. The government is advised by the advisory committee and it employs inspectors and other officers to enforce this act. The act itself provides a legislative framework and includes the regulation which prescribes ways of achieving an acceptable level of risk. It also includes recognised standards and guidelines that state ways of achieving an acceptable level of risk. The Act also provides for advisory information, for example guidance notes, safety notices, mining hazard databases or other information. The Act imposes obligations on persons at mines and in particular the holder of the mining tenure, the mine operator and the site senior executive. The site senior executive is obligated to develop a management structure with senior and supervisory persons at the mine. In order to develop and implement a safety and health management system for the mine using risk management practices in order to develop hazard management plans and procedures that contain the necessary controls and in particular today we talk about critical control management, change management, contractor management and emergency management. Knowing and applying the legislation is our best chance of ensuring that we ensure the safety and health of every person at every mine every day. The Queensland Mining Industry Health and Safety Conference is your partner to protect the safety and health of your mine workers by sharing our knowledge of the legislation for the safety and health of our mine workers today and into the future. We have paid a high price for the knowledge that we have gained. The legislation aims to ensure that the tragic events of the past are not repeated.